Now, we're in this series called Superpowers. Everybody say Superpowers. And it's called Superpowers and about spiritual gifts. And in this series, we have, uh, we've given a working definition of what spiritual gifts are. Might wanna, and once again, uh, I want you to take notes during this series. There's a lot of teaching involved, some things you need to take notes or go back and listen to messages or whatever. We gave a working definition of spiritual gifts. It said, spiritual gifts are given for believers in Christ so that Jesus can pursue his mission through the members of his church. Let me say that again. Spiritual gifts are given to believers in Christ, and that's vitally important, so that Jesus can pursue his mission through the members of, of, his, of his church. Now, what is his mission? Well, his mission, number one, is to glorify God. And number two, to seek and save that is lost, and also to build his church where the gates of hell will not prevail against him. I don't know about you. How many of you know that our country and our world is desperately in need for the church of the living God to rise up and start storming some hell gates? Can I get a hand clap of praise on that? Amen. Anybody agree with that? That's right. I mean, we're desperate for that, man. And so that's not going to happen unless you are exercising the spiritual gift that God gave you if you're a believer uh, in Christ. Now, last week we talked about four main reasons uh, that God gives us spiritual gifts. Uh, and we only got to three of them. Let me, I'm just in time of review, let me just give you the first three. Number one, for contribution. God gives us spiritual gifts for contribution. In other words, we said that real church does not take place unless everybody is contributing. Now, you're either a consumer or you're a contributor. Bottom line is. And so God says church works when everybody is contributing. And you may not know what to contribute to, and you may not know how to do that. That's what this spiritual gift conference is for. But uh, God doesn't want you. Now, listen, you may have come in here, and you may be here today, and you're kind of checking us out. And we have a lot of people that do that. I get that. I don't blame you. There are more people in, there's more Baptists in Fayetteville than there are people. Can I get an amen? All right? So I understand that. But here's the bottom line. You may come in here as a consumer. What are y'all going to do for me? What does this church offer? What what kind of music do y'all have? What's the preaching like? What's the atmosphere like? You know, all of that kind of stuff. What am I going to receive? What am I going to consume if I come to this place? I get that. But there's got to come a time, beloved, when you move from being a consumer to a contributor, and all God's people said. And so, so the bottom line is, God wants you to move from being consumer to being a contributor. So contribution is number one. Number two, uh, spiritual gifts help unity and diversity. It helps create unity in diversity. Now, we're all diverse. We have, you look around this room, different backgrounds, different, you know, uh, different nationalities, we, we, you know, even different ages and all of that. And so how do you take all of this diverse uh, group of people and unify them? Because agreeing on the color of the carpet or the amount of lighting or the type of music, that is not what unity is all about. Unity is about the gospel of Christ. So how does God take all of that and unify us together? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 8 through 10, talks, Paul lists about nine different spiritual gifts, many more than nine, but he lists nine. But, but the foundation of what he talks about is in verse 11. He says this, but one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributed to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one, has many members, but all the members that are one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And he's using the body, the physical body, how many different members we have and all that, but it all works together. And spiritual giftedness, you knowing your giftedness, me knowing my giftedness, helps create that unity. So we're all working together to do what? Glorify God, reach lost people, and build a church where the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Then number three, hope you're taking notes, spiritual gifts build authenticity in believers. Now, Paul moves from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 right into 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is a great love chapter, chapter that's read mostly at weddings, chapter I read when I do weddings and that kind of thing. No, Paul did not lose his notes. He did not lose his place. He's not changing subjects. He is still on the subject of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, all about spiritual gifts. But what Paul does in chapter 13, 
15, he moves from spiritual gifts to spiritual fruit. And he talks all about love. And the reason why that is, is so that nobody can say, well, I don't have the gift of love. That's just not me. I just who I am. I'm a jerk for Jesus. No, you ain't. All right. And so we said this, we said, you can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. Anybody believe that? Say amen. All right. Matter of fact, I want us to say it together. You guys are a little quiet today. I'm going to try to warm you up, try to get you fired up a little bit. You can love without serving, but you cannot, I mean, you can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. Everybody say that with me. Okay. You can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. So that's what, uh, that's what chapter 13 is all about. So now number three, we're going to dive right into it. Talked about the first three. Let's look at the fourth one. Very, very important. Number four, spiritual gifts shape us. Spiritual gifts shape us. Now everybody grab your Bible, turn your Bible, turn on your Bible, however you want to get to a Bible, make sure you get to one and turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now, in Romans chapter 12, Paul is giving, uh, he's going to give another list of spiritual gifts. But before he does that, he, uh, he talks about some shaping that's got to go on. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll see the two words that he uses to describe that. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed. Everybody say conform. That's a shape. The world trying to conform you, mold you, shape you to their image. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. That's another shape. That's releasing or transforming or God molding and making you what he wants you to be. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, this is what I want you to see. Let me, let me just go over here a minute. Everybody, I want you to see this. Uh, is, is that your spiritual gifts not only shape you for church. Now, that's a given. We understand that. You, you, you're, you know, your spiritual gifts are operating in the church. Uh, but what we need to understand is your spiritual gifts are given by God First of all, and foremost, believe it or not, to shape you in your home life. Because let me remind you, anybody agree with this? Don't you remember that God created the home way before he created the church, right? So your spiritual gift is to shape your home life. And not only that, but your spiritual gift is also to shape your work life. So every area of your life, even your recreational life, Every area of your life, your church life, your home life, your work life, your recreation life, your school life, I mean, everything is shaped by your spiritual gifts. Now, Rick Warren, and I think we did this study years and years ago, but Rick Warren uh, has come up with an acronym, which I really like, and I think he's right on target, came up with an acronym called SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E. Now, Rick Warren says that everybody has a shape. And, and that's true. Now, uh, some of you here today, uh, you have a thin shape, a slim shape. Do not trust you. But anyway, so, but you have that. Cannot identify with you. Some of you will eat at, uh, like two bites of a hamburger and say, I can't eat another bite. You're a freak. But anyway, so, but that's okay. I love you. You're just, you know, and some of you are built, some of you are buff, some of you have an hourglass shape, you know, slim in the waist, some big shoulders. Man, I have that. It's just under all this. But anyway, and then some of us are round, okay? But can I remind you, round is a shape. Can I get an amen? Do I have any round people that are with me today? Am I up here by myself? Woo! Yes. All my round peeps. Round's a shape. Oh, by the way, the other day, I asked my wife, Phyllis, I said, honey, have you seen my belt around the house? She said, oh, does it fit around that now? (laughs) Y'all pray for us. Now, he's not talking about that kind of shape. 
He's talking about S-H-A-P-E. Let me give you one. Write it down. Write it down. Here we are. Number one, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. S-H-A-P-E. That's your shape. And right there at the top of the list, which is why I agree with what he's saying, right there at the top of the list is the S, the shape, the spiritual gifts. Now, certainly, everybody, whether you're a believer or not a believer, it doesn't matter. Everybody is born with a heart. And I'm not talking about this blood-pumping heart. I'm talking about a heart. I mean, people care. Even an atheist care, which is kind of beyond me. Why would you care? But they do. Uh, you can love. I loved. I love things. I love my mama. Uh, I love I love things uh, when I didn't know Jesus, and so you're born with capacity to love, but it's not spiritual love, and that's all the difference in the world. It's a different kind of love when, after you know Christ. Every everybody everybody's born with abilities, but they're not supernatural abilities. Uh, even basketball players that can dunk and do 360, uh, 360 and, and and all of that, they have abilities, but they're, that, that that doesn't mean they're spiritual. Abilities. Everybody has personality, but I don't know about you, but when I, before I knew Christ, my personality was all self-centered. It was all about me. I was not others-centered. I had a personality, a good personality. I, you know, I love to go to party, woohoo! But I didn't, I, I, I didn't care about others. It was all about me. And everybody has experiences. But the bottom line is, you don't see your experiences through the lens of God's eyes. You just don't do that. And so everybody has that, and, and, and if you have that, uh, then, you know, that, that's, you're born with that. As a matter of fact, book of Romans, chapter 1, we don't have time to turn to it. But in the book of Romans, chapter 1, and it's fascinating, and when you get home, start reading it, because it's really, a, because Paul gives the downward spiral of how man started and how we got to where we are. I mean, you look at the world today, and you shake your head, you say, how did we get here? Well, it didn't catch God by surprise. I mean, we were always, listen, if you're an evolutionist today, then basically you believe that everything's going upward. If you're an evolutionist, you believe everything's getting better, survival of the fittest, and that we have what we have. We have the animals that we have, and we have the trees that we have, and we have humans that we have. Everything's getting better. Everything's evolving into better. And God said, no, 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 no. Everything's not getting better. Everything's getting worse. Everything's not going up. Everything is spiraling down. Do I have anybody that believes that? Say amen. And I'm not being a prophet of doom. It's just the way it is. And you can see it today. You say, man, what in the world? People thinking, what are we doing? Why, are, why is things happening? It's because God said, no, you're spiraling down. You're going down, down, down. Matter of fact, when Adam and Eve was created in the Garden of Eden, everything was up. They had, a perfect, they had a perfect environment. They had a perfect existence. They could walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. No thunderstorms, no tornadoes, no thorns, no wild animals to bite them, no snakes, all that kind of stuff. But the moment that sin entered in the world, everything started going down. It's been going down, down, down. You say, not me. I'm not going down. Take a look at your driver's license, Bubba. You're going down. You're just going down. Now, Paul says, look, this is, this, is, this is important to understand because what happens is we're living, it's going down so much that most people, they, listen, they, they, they believe, they, they want to enjoy creation, but not the creator. In other words, and I, and I know you, you didn't get up this morning and put on deodorant to come here. I, I hope you did. It don't matter to me, I'm far from you, but the people beside you hope you did. But you didn't get up and put on deodorant this morning to hear this. But if you don't know Jesus today, listen to me, you don't want God. You just want his stuff. You, 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 listen, you just, you, you're not enjoying the creator. You just, you just want his creation. You just want his stuff. You're, you're, not, you're not after Jesus. You just want, you just want Jesus, what Jesus can do for you. And, and Paul said, this is, this is, this is the downward spiral, and this, and, this, and this is where we are. In other words, if you're outside of Christ, you have no shape. You have no shape. Now, you have a heart, and you have abilities, and you have personality, and you have experience, but all that is is hate. I don't know what that is. And so when you get born again, then God changes everything. See, if you're born once, listen to me, listen to me, say amen. If you're born once, you're going to die twice. 
But bless God, if you're born twice, you only die once. Can we get an amen? Amen? And so God said, if you're born again, and by the way, what do we think God meant when he said, behold, old things are passed away. Behold what? All things become new. And what's new? Because God adds the S. God adds the shape to your life. He adds the spiritual gifts now, the giftedness, the purpose of your life that's all shaped in everything that you do, your personality, your abilities, and all that. God adds all of that. Now listen, everybody in this room, everybody in this room has natural talents. Now you, you may not buy that, you may not believe in that. Uh, for instance, I, I can do this. Some of, you, some of you can do that, but most of you would go. And some of, I know some of you, are, it's, I know, I'm talented. It's this. I can do that. I was born with that. I'm, I'm blessed with this. Some of you can't do that. I don't know. Some, some, some of you can wiggle your ears. I can't wiggle my ears. Some of you can wiggle your ears and your toes will move. You're a freak. But anyway, so I, I'm just... Kidding. But anyway, so, um, so we're all born with something, you can, something you're good at, you know? Uh, it, it's an amazing thing. A couple weeks ago at the mission, at the, at the mission trip, we, we had our devotionals. Well, we started out devotionals at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we, we found ourselves not getting into bed till like 1 o'clock in the morning doing work and stuff. So we were just all wore out. So we said, well, you guys, you know, all the students, y'all just come at 730, and we'll do our devotional. So we're there at 7.30, you know, and, then, and, and one lesson, we were talking about serving, and one of the lessons, Pastor Phil led it, and, and one, of the, one of the lessons, he asked the students, he said, let me ask you, what are y'all good at? And it amazed me, some of the answers, the great answers. You know, some of them said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm good at cooking. Some of them said, you know what, I'm, I'm good at sewing. We had one, one of our students said, you know what, I'm good at designing clothes. How cool is that? Some said, I'm good at sports. You know, some, some said, you know, I'm good at math. And um, th there's those ones I pray for. But anyway, so, I mean, you know, th and it was just amazing of, of the students that were, that were just good at stuff. Now, they weren't bragging on themselves. I mean, Pastor Phil was asking, what, what are you good at? What do you, what do you enjoy doing? And, the, and they just popped it off just like, and then some of them didn't say anything. They didn't say anything. Now, there's probably two reasons for that. You remember I said, it's 7.30 in the morning. How many of you know no teenager is any good for anything at 7.30 in the morning? And all God's teenagers sat, all right? That's right. But the second reason is, some of them probably thought, I'm not good at anything. I'm just normal. You know, I'm just, I'm not that good at anything. And can I tell you, that's a lie. That's absolutely a lie. God, listen, God formed you and God knitted you and God took care to create. You're not one of a billion, you're one of a kind. And, and God formed you and created you in your mother's womb. And I promise you, God gave you some natural talents. There's some things you're, you're good at. There's some things you enjoy. Now, now, my wife, when we're in school, my wife is extremely smart. She made, she made A honor roll. She was on the honor society. I don't know even, I have no idea why in the world she even married me. While she was making honor society, I was doing detention hall. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was. Hated. I didn't, I didn't hate school. I like school. That's where I hung out with my friends. I love school. I just, I just hated the grades. I hated studying. I hated, I hated class, you know? But my wife loved class. She loved to study. She loved term papers, you know? She's weird. That's why she married me, I guess. I don't know. Hey, by the way, isn't it kind of weird? that I hated that, and now that I'm saved, God called me to a life of study. <laughs> I mean, you know, God has a great sense of humor, you know? And, and, and the teachers would say, well, you know, in, 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 in six weeks, you got to present an oral report. Man, I didn't want to do an oral report. I mean, I didn't want to have to do the study for an oral report. And oral reports made me nervous, you know, and I'd have to do those cue cards or those, you know, index cards, and they'd fall down on the floor, and the kids would laugh, and, you know, I hate, I dreaded oral report. 
But good night, man. They gave us two months to come up with it. And it's a strange thing. God has called me to a ministry where every Sunday I got to do an oral report every week. And it's got to be good enough that you'll come back and hear it again. Can I amen? You know what I'm saying? Right? That's right. God's up in his heaven going, <laughs> got you, buddy. So you don't know what your spiritual gift will do. I didn't have a natural talent for speaking, you know. Uh, so, so, so you don't know. All right? But keep in mind, listen to me, natural talents are not spiritual gifts. And, uh, and, and why is that? I'll tell you why it is. Because if you're here today and you think, well, I'm not that good at anything naturally, so I must not be good at anything spiritually. And God said, that's stinking thinking. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, when I saved you, when I came into your heart and I came into your life, I have gifted you. You are a gifted child of God. And you and your mind, and I promise you, I will use you beyond anything you can ever imagine. I believe that with all of my heart. Now, what's the difference? Here's, here's the big difference. The difference is, the difference is this. Spiritual gifts result in spiritual results. Uh, spiritual gifts result in spiritual results. Uh, uh, spiritual results. That, that's, that's what they do. Listen, when I was in college, uh, I graduated from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. It's it a, it a liberal arts school. I majored in religion. Uh, I minored in U.S. history, but I majored in religion. I sat under professors that had more degrees by their name than a thermometer. And I got nothing. I mean, some of those classes, they tried to teach the Bible. They tried to teach some of that. So I got nothing from them. But I'll tell you what, I have sat under somebody that barely had a high school education filled with the Spirit of God and had the Word of God just come alive in my heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. It's an amazing thing. What, why, why is that? I mean, this guy's, these guys were educated, but I got nothing from them. Well, the difference is, man, it's the Holy Spirit. It's giftedness. It's giftedness. So I love to sit under gifted Bible study teachers and, and all of that. I, I'm just telling you right now, if, you, if you're not here on Wednesday night, you're, you're missing out on some of the best things we do at Inlay Baptist Church. Not only Awana and Awanas, uh, you know, choir practice and all that, but also that 6 o'clock Bible study under, under Pastor Chris, who's gifted, so gifted to teach the Bible. I don't teach that class, by the way. I attend. That's, I attend that class. And uh, so it's, it's an amazing thing, all right? Uh, so it's imperative that you... For, for God to shape you, it's imperative for you to know what your spiritual gift is. Now, we're going to help you on September 16th because you'll notice I'm not going down the individual list of the gifts. We're going to do that on September 16th. And, it's imper- and you're going to take a spiritual gift test, find out where you're gifted and where you're strong and all that. But that's on the, uh, September 16th. So you better sign up quick. First 200, get it. And that's it. But let me, t- let me, let me do this let me, very quickly. Let me give you four reasons why you need to know your spiritual gifts. Four reasons. Number one, uh, first of all, your spiritual gifts shape your work. Your spiritual gifts shape your work. You're here for more than just to get a paycheck. And all God's people said, you're here more than just take up space. Now, I got to be honest. I love you. I love you guys with all my heart, but some of you are taking up space. You're a consumer. You come in here and say, well, let's see what the band's got going on today. Let's see what the pastor's got going on today. And you come and you're taking up space and you're not contributing. And God said, listen, I didn't create you to take up space. I can, I, listen, if you're in this church, if you come to this church, I want to tell you something. What our hearts is ours to move you from being a consumer to being a contributor as fast as we can. How many of you know that? You need to know that. You, you, God said, I didn't create you to create but, And God said, I, I created you in your work life to use you, to gift you, even in your work life. Uh, we, uh, we left for the men's conference on Friday. Uh, when we left, it was like, I don't, I don't know. It, in Fayetteville, this, this past week, it's like, what, 125, 130 degrees? I don't know. But anyway, it was hot. So we're in this bus. We're, we, get in our, we get in the church bus. And, and the church bus, if you've never seen it before, it's a good church bus. But basically, it's a metal tube. 
and it's 100 degrees outside. And we get in this, 18 guys getting this metal tube. And it's got two air conditioners, you know, one in the front, one in the back. If you're in the middle, mm, it's like being in Hades. Are right? you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just really hot. And, it, it was, and the air conditioners were working as hard as they could. It was just so hot outside. And so, you know, I was in the middle, you know. So we stopped for a break. We stopped at a rest stop. Now, I didn't realize this, but Chris Jones, one of the members of our church, he works in our student department, you know, that kind of thing. Chris Jones uh, was following us. He was going to the conference. I didn't know it. And he was in his heating. Chris Jones has a heating and air conditioning company. And so he was in his heating and air conditioning van. And so we get out, and we're all drinking water and everything. And I look at Chris, and I said, Chris, you got air conditioning in your van? He said, he said yeah, man. He said, my van's only a couple years old. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, are you by yourself? He said, yeah. I said, you ain't now. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, did you desert those guys on that bus? Yep, I did. I did. And the other ones were thinking that I was the only one that did it. Glory to God. But anyway, so I get in Chris's van, man. I said, crank that air up, buddy. And he did, son. And, uh, but here's what happened. He started getting some calls for his business. And he was on speakerphone because he was driving. And people said, man, Chris, can you, can you come out on Monday? Can you come out on Tuesday? And, you know, I, my, man, my air conditioner's on the blink, and I need, I need help. And, man, he was, Chris was so kind, and, you know, and, and uh, all of that. Thing. And then it dawned on me. I'm not driving in Chris's van that's a heating and air conditioning van, but I'm driving in his ministry van. Y'all know what I'm saying? And I told Chris, I said, Chris, you do know what you have here. You don't have just a heating and air conditioning business. You have a ministry, you know? And, and, and so what I'm saying is, whatever you do, because here's what's so easy. I mean, you look at the staff and all that, and you say, well, you know, I, I'm not in full-time Christian service. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. And everything you do, if you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a plumber, you're a soldier, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. All of us, if we're born again, are in full-time service for the Lamb of God. What? To bring glory to God, to reach lost people, and to build a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And all God's people say it. It's amazing. Number two, spiritual gifts will remind you of your worth. They will remind you of your worth. Listen, guys, I'm going to tell you something. We're getting beat down. We're getting beat down. The world, the, the culture is saying you guys are real, irrelevant. You guys need you. You guys don't know what you're talking about. You guys are all political. You guys are all homophobes. You guys are all bigots. I mean, and, and the world's just hammering us with that. And that's nothing could be further than the truth. We're not that. We're not that at all. But the world is saying that we are, and the culture is saying that we are. And here's the problem with that: if you're not careful, you are going to start believing it yourself. And you're going to start believing, well, I'm not relevant. And I'm not making a difference. And maybe it's not worth taking a stand. And you're going to start believing it yourself. Spiritual gifts get rid of all that. Spiritual gifts let you know how your worth is. How much you're, listen, if Jesus Christ would leave heaven's glory down across and forgive you of your sin and save your soul and then turn around and make you a joy and heir of Christ and then gift you for service on this earth, you are more valuable to him than anything in all of this world. The Bible says, what does it profit a man? What does it profit a woman? What does it profit a teenager? What does it profit any of us if we should gain the whole world and lose our own soul? You are more important to God than this whole world. Somebody ought to give God a hand clap of praise for that. Amen? That's right. That's right. How many believe that? Say amen. Amen? Your worth. Spiritual gifts. Listen, listen to what God said, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Everybody say good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice he didn't say that we should walk in him. Of course we should walk in him. But he's talking about them. He's talking about good works. And God says, I want you to walk in good works. In your spiritual gift. And by the way, the, work, the, the Greek word for workmanship is the word where we get our word poem from. Did you know that? God said, you're my poem. 
Uh, some translations, and I like the translations that say, you are his masterpiece. And you are. Never, never forget that. I don't care who you are. I don't care what mom and daddy said. I don't care, I don't care, what, I don't care if you've been bullied. I don't care what everybody people say about you on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all of that stuff. I'm telling you, you are a child of God. You are his masterpiece. There's nobody like you. Glory to God for that. Number three, spiritual gifts are an act of worship. Did you know that? Discovering your spiritual gifts is the greatest way to worship God. I'm not making this up, but what he said, let's go back to Romans chapter 12 very quick. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God doesn't want dead worship. He doesn't want dead sacrifice. He wants everything living. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, your translation may say, which is your spiritual act of worship. And when I first read that years and years ago, I thought, wait a minute, that seems like a far cry from reasonable service. How do, you get a, how do you get reasonable service and translate it into spiritual act of worship? Well, think about it. If you're surrendered to God and you're yielded to Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God and God is filling you and using you and you're working out of your giftedness for his glory to bring glory to God, to reach people for Jesus, and to build a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against, that is the highest form of worship. And all God's people said, I love music. I love our band. I love it. All my soul. Can't wait to get in here. You know, love what Jason and Danny and all these guys do. I, 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 I just love it. But I got to tell you that the greatest form of worship is not singing praise songs. The greatest form of worship is not hearing a sermon. The greatest form of worship is not preaching a sermon. The greatest form of worship is to yield to God and let God use you through your giftedness all right and then and then thirdly uh at, well and then he says your spiritual gifts are, are uh, and by the way before i move on can, can i just say this i was made for this I, i'm not bragging this is, I, i'm not bragging at all but i can just tell you right now that uh that when i come here the reason why I, when i the reason why i can worship here the way i do and and i do and i and i love it i love the music i love the, the i love the volunteers i love everything I, I love this environment i love it all because i was made for this i was and and and, and, and the bottom line is uh, when, when i had talent i could sing but before I got saved, I was a singer. I, matter of fact, in my high school, you can ask, in my high school, I was a popular singer. I had all the solos in the, in the, in the school musicals. I had all the solos in the, in the school choir. And, and, and I could sing. I, God gave me that natural talent that I could, that I could sing. And, 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 and by the way, I didn't even know it back then, but some of the songs that, that our choir, my choir teacher was a believer, I didn't know that. But, but I, some of the songs that we that we sang were even spiritual songs. We sang, we, I re, we sang Oh Happy Day. Now I'm not talking about the old Southern Baptist Oh Happy Day. I'm talking about the Andre Crouch. Oh Happy Day, Oh Happy Day, Oh Happy Day, Oh Happy Day. When Jesus was, when Jesus. Was. Thank you. Anyway, so I can rock on that song, man. And I have the whole high school going, yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't have a clue what we were singing. It meant nothing. But then God saved me. And he took some of those things in me. And he used it for spiritual results. That's why I worship. I was made for that. I was made to do what I'm doing right now. I know this church can get a better preacher. I know that. I know this church can get a preacher that can go deeper. I know this, I know this church can get a preacher that can teach you better and disciple you better and can organize better. I know that. But I want you to listen to me here in Lake Baptist Church. Your pastor was made for this, whether you like it or not. I'm telling you, in 28 years, you wouldn't believe the number of times I didn't want to be here. I didn't think physically. 
physically I could get up on this stage. I didn't I have a cold. I had sore muscles. I had, you know, I had hardships in my life. I had all that and I didn't want to come and I thought I could barely make it up those steps. But the moment I got here, man, I was energized to preach the gospel of the Lamb of God. I was made for this. And all God's people said, yes. And I know what some of you have said before. Pastor, you get wound up like that, I'm afraid you're going to die of a heart attack. Well, let me tell you something, Bubba. If I did die of a heart attack and I dropped dead on this stage, it would take the undertaker three days to get the smile off my face. Glory! Amen! That's right. I like that. Do you know why I love it? I had, I had had somebody at the conference. I ran to a pastor friend. He said, how long have you been in Air Lake anyway? I said, man, I've been there over 28 years. He said, how in the world have they put up with you for 28 years? I said, because they don't have high standards. That's why. <laughs> anyway, so, and you don't. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Giftedness. I was made for this. I don't get wore out for this. My wife would tell you, I don't get up in the morning and say, man, I dread being around those good for nothing, God forsaken, will not commit to anything people. I never say that. I never say that. Man, I can't wait. It's giftedness. Some of you, bless your heart, you'll try something, you'll go, you'll try it, and three weeks later, well, I don't like that. It's because you're serving out of your giftedness, man. Giftedness. Worship energizes you then lastly listen to this wrap it up spiritual gifts cause you to shine in your witness your spiritual gifts cause you to shine in your witness and I, the moment I said witness I lost half of you right there I know I can hear the air get sucked out of the room well reader witnessing ain't my gift no 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 brother you got that wrong evangelism is a gift the evangelist is a gift to the church witnessing is a command from God and all God's people say you got no choice the moment that Jesus said what did Jesus say Jesus said listen let your light shine before men don't you hide it under a bushel it does nobody any good the moment I saved you I saved you to, to penetrate the darkness with your light and maybe you don't do it the way I do. Maybe you don't have the personality that I don't have. You don't. Maybe you're not as comfortable confronting people as I am. I get that. But that, takes, that does not take away from your giftedness to let your light shine for Jesus. Let me give you the greatest illustration that I know, and then I'm going to let the band take over. All right? We're going to be out of here in about five minutes. Here we go. Stay with me. One of the greatest illustrations. This is a true story. Absolute true story. I'm not, I'm not making this up, and some of you are not going to believe me, and you hurt my feelings when you do, but that's, I'll have to deal with that, all right? Several years ago, several years ago, on one of our mission trips to Belize, we had it in our head that we were going to go down there to Punta Gorda, uh, Belize. There's a park down there, and it had a stage. It had a concrete stage, and we had it in our mind we were going to go down there, and we were going to do a crusade like Billy Graham. I was going to be Billy Graham. And, uh, and so we had our team all ready. We, we, we brought Bibles with us. We brought songbooks. We brought hymnals. Well, we had some people who were going to play for us. We, 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 uh, we, had, we called ahead and had people set up chairs. We were going to set up chairs. We had all of that. We were so excited about doing a crusade in that park. First night, we set everything up. Everybody was ready. We, we were going to do the Billy Graham thing, and nobody showed up. Nobody showed up. Some of you teenagers that were on the SWAT tour this summer, nobody showed up. You got very discouraged. I know what that's like. Nobody showed up. I'm, I'm had, I was ready. I was, I was ready to be Billy Graham. I could picture thousands. You know, when I said, come, 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 let's sing. Just, no, man, that's my Billy Graham invitation. But anyway. Nobody showed up. They were in the park, but nobody came near our chairs, our stage, our singing, nothing. Second night, same thing. I got discouraged. Our team was discouraged. And uh, 
So we didn't know what to do. Now, this is where it gets weird. And you can, and you, you're gonna, you're gonna think, I, I don't know about that, but I'm just telling you. So I'm standing there and just thinking, Lord, what, what are we gonna do? This is not working. A little kid on a bicycle, he's probably about 10 years old, comes on a bicycle and goes, hey, mister, what you doing? I said, well, we're getting, we're getting, ready, to, we're getting ready to have a, uh, a meeting where we're going to tell people about Jesus and we're going to give out Bibles. He said, Bibles? Real Bibles? I said, yeah. He said, you're going you're gonna to give Bibles? Give them. I said, yeah. Real Bibles? I said, yeah. Do you want one? You, you would give me a real Bible. I said, by the way, how many of you know in this country, we're so stinking spoiled, it probably makes God sick. He said, you give me a real Bible? I said, yeah, I'll give you a real Bible. I said, let's go get one. So I grabbed one off the stage. And I said, now listen, before I, I'm going to give you this Bible, but let me show you a couple of scriptures. Would you like me to do that? And he said, yeah. So I took him to the Roman road. Now, the moment I opened my Bible, there was a dog on this side of the park. There was a dog on this side of the park. I'm standing there with the boy and his bicycle. And those two dogs convened at our feet and had the worst dog fight you can ever imagine. It was teeth, hair, and eyeballs at my feet. And I was going, here, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to beat the dogs with the Bible. The moment I shut my Bible, they quiet down. I'm not kidding. I had my Bible open, closed the Bible, and it went, I went, that's weird. I said, come here, son, let me show you. Open my Bible. Close my Bible. Then it dawned on me. You are not on your turf. You're on their turf. And this turf is eat up with satanic activity. Put me in a pigeonhole you want to. I know I'm Southern Baptist. I'm born and bred, and I'll be Southern Baptist dead. But can I tell you, Jesus got me before Southern Baptist did. Can I get an amen? Amen? So I go to the team, and I said, listen, guys, we got a problem here. We need to pray. we got to pray the devil out of this place. We all gathered hands. We got in the middle of that park and we all gathered hands. And I'm not kidding. We prayed Satan out of that place. We said, God, you bind the devil. You bind spiritual warfare. You bind all that. You give us weapons that are beyond us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the moment we said amen, everybody went and grabbed their Bibles and they split out in all different places. Now, some of them talked to people with a Bible sitting on a bench. Some of them got on the park with some of the swings with their kids and giving them the Bible and showing them some Bibles. Some of them went and went to a bar. We had a couple of guys that went to a bar and they were in the second story of a bar and they were hollering out. They were saying, hey, everybody come up here in this bar. We got something we want to tell you about. We found out there were some kids in a park playing basketball and they said, hey, there's some kids playing basketball. Some of our basketball players, which wasn't me, went down there and started telling those kids playing basketball about Jesus. A truckload of, Brazil, of, 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 of uh, uh, Belizean soldiers pulled up on maneuvers in the back. And our, a little lady that I didn't even hardly know, a young lady in our church, her name was Maggie. And I never seen anything like it in my life. Maggie saw those Belizean soldiers that little woman and she was no taller than this she grabbed some of them Bibles jumped up in the back of that truck started speaking to them in Spanish I didn't even know Maggie spoke Spanish I thought Maggie was speaking in tongues I didn't know but they were understanding her and she gets up there and starts witnessing to them and all over that park our team started witnessing and witnessing in different ways but under the power of the Spirit of God that's what God will do to a church that will yield to him and use their giftedness for the glory of God. And all God's people said. And to this day, we still made an impact in that area. 
wasn't our way. It was God's way. Do you know your gift? Are you taking up space? Come on. What's your ministry? What's your ministry? Where are you gifted? Are you a consumer? Are you a contributor? It's vital. I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you what your gifting is. I can't even tell you what your ministry is. And I know you want us to do that. I know you want us to say, this, this, we, want, we, need you here. we want you here. This is what you're supposed to do. No, no, sometimes you've got you to discover it on your own. But it's vital. Because without spiritual gifts, you just have H-A-P-E. That's nothing. But the S will shape you in the church, in the home, and in your work. Let's pray together, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for not only saving us if we're believers, but gifting us for the glory of God. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Today, in this place, in the quietness of this moment, I want to ask you a personal question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus in the way that you should know Jesus, not know about Jesus? But do you know him? I don't mean do you believe in him like you believe in George Washington. I don't mean that like a historical person. Do you know him in such a way that you are allowing him to direct your life, to gift you, to use you, to give you, to shape you in your life? And if you're here today and you say, preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know Jesus that way. I, I'm not sure what my shape ought to be. I want to know. I don't want to waste my life. I want to know what my purpose is. I want to know what my shape is. Well, if you do, and you want to know Christ as Savior, as Lord, then bow your head right now. Close your eyes right now, everybody. If you're here today and you're not sure, but you want to be sure, then pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and my sin has separated me from you, and I'm so sorry. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, by faith, I'm asking you to forgive me. And by faith, I'm thanking you for forgiving me. And by faith, I'm asking you to come into my heart, come into my life. I want to know you. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to give me a home in heaven. And I want you to give me my shape. And I want to know your will. And I want to walk with you. And I want you to guide me and protect me and watch over me. I long for that, and I'm asking you for that right now. Save me, Jesus. In your name I pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer this morning, you really meant it. You really meant it. Raise up your hand. Raise it up. Hold it up. Keep going. God bless you. Just hold them up. Just keep them up. Don't put them down. I prayed that prayer. I really meant it. Just hold them up. Keep going. I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do something else right now. It's just us. It's just me and you. You got your hand raised. I'm going to ask you to do one other thing. Would you stand? Just stand. Stand to your feet right now. If you got your hand raised, stand to your feet. God bless you. Come on. Stand up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else. Just remain standing. You can bow your head, but remain standing. All right? Okay? Anybody else? Come on. There's some people. God's working right now. I know, I know what time it is. God's working right now. You don't want to leave right now. God's working. Anybody else? Just stand up. Stand up to your feet. I know it. Okay? Now listen. Listen, guys, I want, everybody, I want you to look up at me. I want you to look up at me. Listen, I know you got doubts. I know you got questions. You probably think, I don't know what I'm doing right now. That's okay. But listen, this is what I want you to do, all right? By the way, if, if, if you, if you kind of doubt that we might think you're weird or kind of strange, everybody else in this place has done exactly what you're doing right now, and we're excited about it. Would you let them know we're excited about one, two, three, four, five, coming to Jesus? Yes.